Hello friends. Thank you for joining us on this platform where we share our thoughts and views on books we read. As you know, children's literature is one of our favorite areas of exploration. And in this post, we featuring one of our all-time favorite writers, Satyajit Ray. His name needs no introduction. He is famous for his movies that received worldwide praise. He is one of those people who were born with so much talent that they achieve scintillating success in whatever form of art they practice. While his international fame is linked to the movies he directed, we are also big fans of his writing. He has given us memorable characters like Feluda and Professor Shonku and so on. He also edited the children's magazine Sandesh, which was started by his grandfather. He was also a brilliant illustrator and his children's stories contain his own sketches. A lot of his writing is in Bangla, in Bengali. In last few years, Arunava Sinha has been translating those to English and we have been revisiting those stories. On Think Abuse, we have shared our reviews on books including On the Run with Fatih Chand, Two Magicians and Adventures of Feluda. And the book for today's talk is a collection of four stories called The Magic Moonlight Flower and Other Enchanting Stories. As the name suggests, this collection comprises of four stories. Stories of magic and moonlight, of beasts and birds, of ogres and princesses. Looking at this hardcover edition, published in 2014 by Rupa Publication, it comes to mind that while a book cover is a very important element of the book, being the first impression and all, it is not easy to design. The designer needs to show off the stories and the characters and at the same time make it attractive and appealing to the readers. This book is mostly for young readers, so the cover page needs to be adventurous, imaginative and vibrant. This cover page ticks many of the above boxes as it features a hero battling a green serpent while we can see the moonlight flowers growing behind him on an orange background. It is hard to determine the age of the hero depicted on this cover page, but his eyes reminded me of a typical Bangla image that most readers will find very familiar. Now let's open the book and delve into the stories one by one. The first story in the book is called Sujan Harbola, The Boy Who Spoke to Birds. From the days of his childhood, Sujan is attracted to bird calls and has an uncanny ability to mimic those. So much so that his father gives up any hopes of Sujan looking after his grocery business when he grows up. Instead, Sujan will be a herbola. Herbolas can imitate the sounds of different birds and animals and they usually make their living by performing this mimicry for audiences as they travel from village to village. When visiting the forest of Chanrali near his village Kira, Sujan very cleverly saves a tiger from being hunted by the king. Now the king has a lovely daughter as kings do in these stories, and her name is Princess Srimati. Srimati lives within the walls of her palace and is never out in the sunshine. She has never had a chance to enjoy the beauty of nature. Her world is limited inside her room and in her books. Her future is also fixed. She is going to be married to the Prince of Ajapur soon. So the king invites Sujin to come to his palace and perform various bird calls for his daughter so she can enjoy a bird song from within her walls. The king also tells Sujin about the monster that lives in the Akashi mountain. Flocks of birds willingly travel to the cave of this monster 
where he eats those. After Srimati hears Sujan perform a variety of bird calls, she falls in with the bird song and the beautiful creatures who can make these lovely songs. So she decides to delay her wedding. Instead, she says that she could only marry a person who will kill the Eviswar, the monster of the mountain that eats birds. Now who will defeat the monster and win the princess? That is an answer to be found by reading the story. The second story in the book is called Gangaram's Lucky Stone. We meet Gangaram as he is skipping flat pebbles in the river and he finds a beautiful stone. So far, his life has been average. He grew up without his parents in the small village of Benkunta. He lives with his uncle Gopinath and cultivates a small piece of land. He may not be rich, but he is kind-hearted, uncomplicated, handsome and well-loved in his village. The stone, however, brings good luck and fortune to Gangaram. And if you suddenly become rich in a small village, then this is to be noted by everyone, including his cousin Raghunath. Raghunath consults Aghur Baba to find out the reason for this sudden turn in Gangaram's fortune. Aghor Baba tells Raghunath about not only the seven-veined good luck stone, but also about the other hidden fortunes. And so, Raghunath engages his thief friends to steal the stone. Meanwhile, Gangaram hears the advertisement by the princess of Kanakpur, having lost the stone. The good intention Gangaram immediately sets off on a journey to return the stone to the princess. But will he finish his journey now that so many other people are out there to steal the stone from him? Once again, we need to read the story to find the answers. The third story in the book is the classic tale, The Ogre and the Princess, like Shrek and Fiona. Young, handsome and happy-go-lucky Ratan goes to a fair of Shimuli where he just gets one glimpse of a beautiful princess and loses his heart. The flutes are playing in the background and Cupid is at play. But in the real world, a village boy like him can only dream of princesses. Fate, however, has other plans. One Sunday afternoon, Ratan receives a visitor. Unbeknown to him, this visitor has a temper, very much like Rishi Durvasa in our old stories. As it happens, Ratan upsets him and so the visitor curses him to become an ogre. Ratan is terrified of the prospect and he goes to astrologer Narhari to find a way out of his plight. The astrologer looks at his future and tells him that although he cannot change the curse, meaning Ratan will have to become an ogre, his fate as an ogre is not long-lasting. He will be human again in this life. So Ratan decides to go and live in the forest of Jalsi where he can spend his time as an ogre until he becomes human. Here he meets Prince Chandrasen who is out hunting. Prince Chandrasen tells Ratan about the man-eating monster that has appeared in a cave in Dambori Hill. Ratan goes to Dambori Hill where the prince and the soldiers have gathered to fight the monster. For a while, Ratan watches from the sidelines but soon it's clear that the humans are no match for these monsters and it is only Ratan who is left to fight. So will Ratan fight this monster and will he win his princess and will he become human again? Please read the story to find the answers. And now we come to the last story of the collection that gives the book its name. The story calls The Magic Moonlight Flower. 
Seventeen year old Kana's father Balram is suffering from a rare disease called Miseria. He'll die within fourteen days until and unless Kanai obtains the juice of moonlight leaves for him. This plant, also called Lunani, is only seen in ancient abandoned temple in the forest of Badra. Without delay, Kanai sets out to get the juice. But when he arrives at the temple, he finds that the plant has disappeared. He meets a 156-year-old man here called Jagai Baba. Jagai Baba knows everything. Unfortunately, he can't remember most of it at all times. So the conversations with him are very interesting. He tells Kanai that the weavers in the kingdom of Rupsha are also suffering from miseria. So the king of Rupsha has taken the plant away. Now Kanai hardly knows how he will travel to Rupsha, obtain the juice and return to his father all within the 14 days time frame. But Jagai Baba is here to help him with magic. He gives Kanai three round objects, one red, one blue and one yellow. Jagai Baba also gives Kanai a seashell through which he can talk to Jagai Baba no matter where he is, like a telephone. By eating the red fruit, Kanai is able to run three times as fast as a deer would, so he sets off for Rupsha. But when he comes to the city, he finds that the king has not cured any of the weavers. What is going on then? Where is the magic plant? Will Kanai succeed in saving all these people and his father? You need to read the story to find the answers. Now that you have some idea of what the stories are about, let me talk about my thoughts on it. One of the main attractions of a Satyajit Ray story for me is that old world feeling before electronics became such an ingrained part of our life. It reminds me of the time when children had the luxury to fantasize about magic, about supernatural forces and believe in stories where the trees and animals could talk. Our daily life was a lot more in tune with the forces of nature and we didn't feel this big isolation with everything that is not either human or created by us humans. There was a time, maybe even 30-40 years ago, when our waterways were completely unpolluted and the rivers ran sweet as honey and clear as glass. There is a description in this book that goes, As the water was clear as glass, all sorts of stones, Red, blue, yellow, russet could be seen beneath it. There was one stone which had every possible color in the rainbow and was shaped like a pigeon egg. It is such a believable description of the rivers as it were before we started dumping all kinds of industrial waste in it. And the author likes to point out that young children need to learn in more than one way. He emphasizes that nature is the biggest teacher. It teaches us to be intuitive, to be kind, to use our brain and our minds to explore without inhibitions that come with growing up and with bookish learning. And the best learnings are still what we learn by observing the natural forces around us. There is a huge difference between watching a peacock on a television screen or in cartoons or even in a zoo and watching it dancing in the rain in its natural habitat. As the author says, how much can books teach you? Reading a book is not the same as seeing with your own eyes or hearing with your own ears, is it? Of course, books are invaluable in the way they become a source of knowledge for us. But I think the author points out in these stories that like everything else in life, there is a balance required between reading and doing. 
As you know, we love the children's books which are big on edutainment. And Satyajit Ray's stories always have a good mix of education and entertainment as he weaves some really deep concepts and thoughts in some very simple sentences. For example, the law of karma and acts and consequences is very simply taught in one sentence here. Who knows how fate works? It is true that God has smiled on me, but I cannot say why. What a deep thought. Or as one of the characters says, I have grown up lacking for things, so I don't even know what the lack of lacking for things is. What a good reminder to all of us who are so privileged. And as you know, the Indian culture is so filled with little proverbs and teachings that we are supposed to follow through in life. Say, Atiti Devo Bhava. Here, the author says, There is no better deed on earth than to serve a guest. But the book is not all preachings and learnings. Young readers like the sense of adventure and they also like to be scared at times. So there is enough of scary bits and supernatural stuff here to stop the book from being boring. So um, let me share with you a couple of descriptions that the author gives in these stories. It's the night of the new moon. You will no longer remain human this evening. You will turn into an ogre. You will become thrice as large in size. You will no longer be able to live in a civilized society. Your food will be wild animals. Scary or magical? The moonlight was indeed planted in a small island, but a king cobra had wound itself around the base of the plant. The snake was about as tall as a human. One bite from this snake would kill a man. A five-foot-wide moat encircled the island, with six or seven alligators wriggling about in the water. And the hero has to wade through these waters to get to his enchanted plant. So, I can recommend this book to all you readers out there who like to tell their children stories of magical adventures featuring young children. And um, if you have a couple of hours to spare and a young one to entertain, you can go for one story at a time. Please do let us know if you have read any of Satyajit Ray's stories or your thoughts on them. Also, please do let us know if there are any other books that you have loved and would recommend for us to read. We would love to hear back from you. Thank you for listening.